invite your attention back to Matthew chapter 26. As we prepare to celebrate uh, our communion today, I just want to look again at this account of Jesus sharing the Last Supper with the disciples to kind of help encourage us in some ways this morning as we receive it to think about some things. You know, this is a weekend of remembrance. And that's what we call Memorial Day. It's a time to remember. But I want us to spend some time today remembering about the life of Christ and what it means for our life past, present, and future. And there's three things I just kind of want to point out as we, as we meditate on this today and that I hope as we observe a communion that will, will make it uh, meaningful to us. First of all, I also notice in this passage of Scripture that we need to remember the reality of our sinfulness. The reality of our sinfulness. Notice what happened uh, as Jesus began this meeting. They were eating. This was a Passover meal and would have been a very traditional Passover meal for them. Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And in doing that, even before doing that, as, he, as they were sitting there, before he got to the point of breaking the bread and starting the somber celebration, he had already upset them. He had already made a comment to them that made them all question what was going on around them when he told them that one of them would betray him. Now imagine if you and I were sitting around a group like that. As, say we were sitting around in a group, and the leader of the group said, all right, there's a mole in the group. Somebody in the group is a spy. I know what my first reaction would be, and I know what your free, first reaction would be. You'd start looking around thinking, hmm, I bet it's him. Or I bet it's her. Or, hmm, I wonder if so-and-so, who could it be? But that wasn't the reaction to Jesus' disciples. Did you notice what he said when, when he told them, one of you would betray me? Verse 22 said they were very sorrowful and they began to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord? Think about that for a moment. They've been following Jesus around for three years. They had seen the glory of God like no one had ever seen before. They were walking with the incarnate Son of God himself. They saw the miracles. They heard the teaching. They heard his prayers. They heard his blessings. Sometimes they heard his rebuke. But boy, had they grown. You go back to the beginning of the Gospels and you read about this ragtag band of fishermen and other scoundrels that Jesus gathered around him. And you think, why in the world? How in the world is Jesus going to be able to get anything out of this? And then it wasn't too long later, he, much longer, he was sending them out in groups of two and they were doing the same miracles that Jesus had done. So they had, they had come a long way. They had been up on a mountain with Jesus and they had literally seen Elijah and Moses come down out of heaven. They'd seen the glory of God. They had heard the voice of God on more than one occasion. Declare that Jesus was his son. They should listen to him. But yet they realized in their heart there was something that could go wrong. Can I just suggest this morning, I think for some of us sometimes, we get a little too smug in our spirituality. We get to thinking because we're better than the average person that maybe we're invincible. And even when we do sin, well, you know, it was because of this or because of that. And we find excuses for it. They made no excuses. They didn't look around and start pointing fingers. They all said, Lord, am I the one? And so as we think about that evening in that room, we think about ourselves. 
We think about that in the capacity, we all, and within us is the capacity, within each and every one of us is the capacity to get off track, to sin. But yet Jesus still loved us. Jesus knew all about that from the very beginning, from the start of time when Jesus began uh, his ministry and even God before the foundation of the world as he laid this world out he created man knowing that man would fall and even when you were born he knew what your life would be like he knew the good that you would do he knew the bad that you would do and even knowing all of that he still loved you knowing in advance he gave you future grace even on the day that you were born knowing who you were. And we come to the table recognizing that, yes, I am a great sinner. But thank God I have an even greater Savior. You see, the problem when we get smug in our spirituality and we begin to think we're God's lucky to have us, we have stepped out of grace. Grace says God is favoring me because I don't deserve it. When we get to feeling too good about ourselves, we are saying God is favoring me because I do deserve it. And we've stepped out of grace. We're not living in grace. The table is the table of grace, and it's a reminder to us that even though we have the potential to fall away, and to some degree every one of us will, the grace of God brings us back. It's not our faithfulness that keeps us in the love of the Father. It is the faithfulness of His Son. It is the faithfulness of His love. It is the faithfulness of His Holy Spirit to bring us back every time. Now, that's a reason to celebrate. That's a reason to recognize that, hey, the pressure is off. Now, does that give me license to sin and do anything I want because I've already got forgiveness? It's already paid forward? No. Real, a real, true, deep understanding of grace should lead us even deeper into wanting to please God and love God and serve God. Just this week, I saw something I, in all my study of the Sermon on the Mount had never noticed before. But the progressive nature of the Beatitudes... Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. What happens when we're poor in spirit? We begin to mourn. We mourn our sinfulness. We mourn our, our, our lack of goodness. We mourn who we are and what we are. And, and, and from mourning, what does that cause us to do? That brings us to a point of meekness. To recognizing, wait a minute. I'm not all of that. I need to surrender and we begin to hunger and thirst for the righteousness that comes from God. And when we get the righteousness and, and, and begin to taste of the righteousness that comes from God, then we begin to want to be a peacemaker for others. We begin to have a pure heart. We begin to, to live for others. And we also live in such a way we may get persecuted. But it all starts with the poor in spirit. The table reminds us that because we are poor in spirit, we needed a Savior, and a Savior has come to our lives. So I challenge us today as we take communion to own up to our sinfulness. Let's leave all of our pretense behind. Let's recognize that we are rotten to the core without Jesus. But thankfully, because of Him, we have been redeemed. The second thing I want us to remember is not just the reality of our sinfulness, but I want us to also remember the cost of our forgiveness. In verses 26 through 28, Jesus took what was normally something from the Passover meal, and he made it something deeper. The broken bread was a reminder of when they ate the bitter, unleavened bread right before leaving Egypt, uh, when God released them. And the blood, the cup that was the blood was a reminder of the blood of the Passover lamb uh, that was spread on the doorpost of each house so that the death angel would pass over that house and they would be spared and be prepared to go. It was a reminder of the great deliverance that God had brought his people out of Egypt and into the, to the wilderness on the way to their own land that he had promised them. But Jesus Reminded them that all of that pointed to the one Passover lamb who would eventually come. 
The one who would eventually lead us all out of the bondage of our own Egypt, the bondage of our sin, into which we were born and held. And it would not come easy. Look what he said in verse 26. He said, take, eat, this is my body. In other accounts of the gospel, they record him elaborating. Matthew kind of gave us the, the abbreviated version. Other accounts of the gospel said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. You think about the physical suffering that Jesus went through leading up to his crucifixion, the beating that he took, the scourging that he took. And you think about the physical aspect of hanging on a cross for six hours. He took a beating for us. He took God's wrath on himself. Now, Christian, what this reminds us of is this. God will no longer be angry with you. Every reason that you might have given God to be angry at you, He took that out on Jesus. Now, does that mean He's always going to be pleased and happy with everything you do? Absolutely not, but He will never pour out His wrath on you. His wrath for you was poured out on Christ. Jesus absorbed it all for us. He will discipline you. And there are times that there are, will be times in your life that God will, will do some pretty difficult things in your life to correct you, but not because He is angry at you, but because He loves you and He wants to correct you into His paths of righteousness for His name's sake. But when we come to the table and we take that bread, we recognize that the body of Christ was broken to receive all of the wrath that God could pour out and one day all the wrath that God will pour out on sin. All of that has already been dumped on Jesus. And you no longer are standing in the way of God's wrath. What a joyous, joyous truth that is. And he took the cup and he said that they should drink from this cup. Because this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It was not unusual in the Old Testament when a covenant was made for an animal to be sacrificed. And for the pieces of of the animal that was sacrificed in this covenant, this arrangement between people, for the pieces of the sacrificial animal to be spread out on the ground and the blood to be saved in a basin. That blood then was poured on the people who were making the covenant and they walked between the pieces of the sacrifice. The idea was that if I break this covenant, may what has happened to this animal happen to me. They were agreeing on the terms of their life. In fact, in the Old Testament, literally in Hebrew, when it talks about making a covenant, it literally says to cut a covenant because of that very picture. But now Jesus is saying this is a new covenant. This is a new agreement. My blood is being poured out. My blood is being given to you. And this juice, this wine will represent what is going to happen in a few hours when my blood institutes and inaugurates a new covenant between God and you. And whereas in an earthly covenant, both parties are required to be faithful or the deal is called off. In this new covenant that I'm making with you, I am making a covenant on my faithfulness that even when you break covenant, I will keep my covenant with you. That is what keeps us saved. That even though we are redeemed, even when we sin, it is that blood of Christ that was shed for us that has already paid for that sin so that the covenant is not broken and God still holds his covenant with us. And so when we have that little cup of juice, we are remembering that Jesus gave his life. He didn't just make a Red Cross pint donation. He gave his life so that we could be free. 
it reminds us of two things. First of all, it reminds us of the seriousness of sin. Think about this for a moment. Go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. God created Adam and Eve, gave them one rule, and they broke it. And God could have said, all right, you know what? You kept all the other rules. You did pretty good. You've been really good to do everything else I've asked you. We're just going to, we're going to overlook this one. I mean, you kept, you know, you, 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 did, you ate like you were supposed to do. You did all the things you were supposed to do. This one little thing, this one rule you broke. But because I love you so much, we're just going to pretend it didn't happen. I'm God. I can do anything I want to do, so I'm just going to declare you forgiven. Well, he couldn't do that. Because what did he tell them when he told them not to eat of that tree? He said, because if you eat from the fruit of that tree, when you do it, you will surely die. Well, if they had not died, God would have been a liar. And the essence of God, one of his essential qualities is that God is truth and that God does not lie, so God would have ceased to be God. Now let's get a little deeper in that because another essential characteristic of God is that God is eternal. He never dies, so it is impossible for God to lie because then he would die and it's impossible for him to die. It's impossible for God not to be God. And so when he said that, that's how serious that disobedience was. And the only counter, the only antidote to the poison of sin was for the blood of his son to be the one that took the death, the spiritual death, the sacrificial death on our behalf. So, that sin that we say, well, you know, it's just the way things are today. That little sin that we have, that we, well, that's just a personality quirk. Well, I just can't help myself. That's just the way I am. All the excuses we make for the sinful attitudes and affections we laugh it off, we explain it away, but it was serious enough that it cost Jesus his life. But the flip side of that coin is not only does the blood of the new covenant show us the seriousness of sin, it shows us the extent of grace. God could have at that moment with Adam and Eve said, okay, that's it, I gave you a chance. No more humans. We'll just enjoy this creation we've made ourselves. No big deal. But he didn't. He sent his son to be that antidote for sin. So not only does it show us as we take that cup how serious sin is, it reminds us how glorious is God's grace that because we couldn't fix it, Adam and Eve tried to sow fig leaves and cover the shame of their sin, and it didn't work. God had to kill an animal, symbolic of what would happen to his son, to give them a covering for the shame of their sin. It was serious, but God was willing to be gracious, gracious enough that one day he would send his son, and that's what we remember today. Theologically, we call this the substitutionary atonement. Now, there's you a big, fancy word you can impress people with. Make them think he went to Bible school somewhere. Substitutionary atonement. He was our substitute. He died in our place. He was our pinch hitter. Our pinch dyer. He went to the cross. It's substitute as our substitute. And it brought atonement. It paid for my sin. Not only did he pinch hit for me, he hit a grand slam where I would have struck out. He did for me what I could not have done for myself. He paid the penalty for that sin. He erased the debt of sin against me. And when we hold that cup in our hand, that is what we will do. We will remember that. 
Now, the sermon is not over, but we're going to stop as we think about this cost of forgiveness and we think about the bread and the cup and we're going to celebrate communion now. And our deacons are going to bring the elements of communion to you. First, they'll bring you the bread. And then after they bring you the bread, they will bring you the juice. And after you have the bread and the juice, we'll stop for a moment and we'll, we'll pray. We'll thank Jesus for sacrifice. And then together we will remember this. But during this time as they bring the elements of the Lord's Supper to you, let me encourage you to pray. Pray prayers of thanksgiving. Pray prayers of praise and rejoicing and what God has done for you that you could not do for yourself as we celebrate him. Join me as we pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you <clears throat> that you were willing to be the sacrifice that would pay for our sins. We thank you that you were willing to give your life for us. The wrath of God was poured out on you. We thank you that you were willing to give your life to institute and inaugurate this new covenant, this covenant of grace. We thank you as we celebrate that you have seen fit to bring us into this life and to make us yours. The covenant works two ways. And so by taking this bread and drinking this cup, <clears throat> we also recommit to you, fresh in you, our desire to live for you, to bring glory to your name. For it's in the great name we pray, the great name of Jesus. Amen. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ. drink, for this is the cup of the new covenant. There is one final part of the story of Jesus and his disciples I want us to end on today because it's such a glorious note. In verse 29, Jesus told his disciples, I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit, this fruit of the vine. Here's another one of those great prepositions. Until. He didn't say he would never drink of the fruit of the vine again, but I'm not going to do it until. Until when? That day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Because you see, what we've done today is not just a reminder of the cost of our sinfulness, and it's not just, or excuse me, the cost of our forgiveness and the reality of our sinfulness. It is also a reminder to us of the promise of the future. Because Jesus said, I will drink of it again with you. And it's a reminder to us that our assurance of heaven is not based on our good works. Our assurance of heaven is not based on how good we can be. That God will somehow at the end of it all measure it out and say, well, you've done more good than bad. Or you had a hard life or there were a lot of strikes against you, so we're just going to gonna let you come on you. It's not based on that at all. It's going to be based on the fact that his son Jesus died for our sins and rose again that we might have life. And that in repentance and faith we turn from our sin and we trusted in Jesus as our Savior and we committed our lives to Him. And He said, I will drink it new. This is going to take on a whole new meaning. I believe we will still have communion when we get to heaven. That's what Jesus was saying. We're going to do this again together in heaven. This is going to have a whole new meaning. This was looking back at what the Passover meant. Today we will look at, uh, today we've looked at what it meant in light of his death and his resurrection, but one day in heaven we're going to look back over all the years of history. 
We're going to celebrate the grand narrative of God. That he created a great world, but that man sinned and separated himself from God but that God intervened and sent his son Jesus as a redeemer to die for sin in order that all who believed in him would have life and live forever. And we will celebrate in heaven forever, not just what heaven is like, not just who in heaven is with us, but we will sing the song of ages to the redeemer. We will sing of the blood of the lamb that has redeemed us, the one who is the central theme in heaven. We will praise his name forever, the glorious work that he has done in our life. And all that we have gone through here on earth will be worth it all. Because we'll be in his presence. Jesus was telling those very words to a group of disciples who were about to watch him be crucified and sealed up in a tomb. And then through a confusing several days, for 40 days, he will be with them even after claiming to rise from the dead, and then he'll go away again. But he left them this promise. We're going to do this again. We're going to have this meal again. The book of Revelation calls it the marriage supper of the Lamb because we're going to celebrate in heaven that it was worth it all, that it worked, that God's promise was true, that we are redeemed. As we close out this morning, I just want to ask you, do you know for certain of your relationship with Jesus Christ? Has there come a time in your life where you recognized your sinfulness and your lack of ability, really, to do anything about it? Have you come to the end of yourself and you're ready to turn away from yourself and to turn toward a Christ who has died on a cross for you? To embrace the life that he has for you, to declare him as your Lord, to receive his forgiveness, and to surrender your life to him. If you've not done that today, we want to give you the opportunity to do that, to know that Jesus stands ready to forgive and to redeem you today. All that we have done in symbolic form, he wants to do in reality in your life. Maybe you have done that, and today is just a reminder to you of how you've let your commitment slip. And what good news it is to you that keeping the covenant is based on his faithfulness to you, not your faithfulness to him. That yes, you are still in covenant with him, and you want to come back in repentance and say, God, I'm sorry that I strayed. I'm sorry that I drifted. Thank you that you have been faithful to me even when I've not been faithful to you. And may by your grace and through the power of your Holy Spirit you enable me to live from this day forward to please you more and more. Whatever it may be that God is laying on your heart, I'm going to ask just if you would to bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. And Music is going to begin to play. If This altar is open if you would like to come and pray or if you would like me to pray with you over anything. As the Lord leads you, you come and allow him to speak to you now.